so I guess we're starting. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the stream. My name is Joanna Pope. I am a researcher based in Berlin um, with a focus on degrowth. And I'm also a producer and composer and had my first release out on TT. And I'm super happy to be joined for this stream by Country Music. Country Music is a curatorial project that since 2017 has released electronic music, published texts, and also produced exhibitions and club nights. So we've got here Daniel Inadi, who's a curator and DJ born in Luxon, based in Stockholm, and uh, Anna Sagstrom, who's a designer and artist born in Fagasta and currently based in Fagasta and New Haven. So welcome, guys. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. Cool. So I guess like we'll start with um, the name of your label because it's kind of an unusual name where it's like I find it quite striking. Um, yeah, I just want to know to, to kind of kick things off. What does the name of, of your project mean to you? And maybe you could introduce some of the geographical ideas that are behind it, um, like because this is basically going to be the focus of our chat now, like kind of geographical concepts, a little bit about degrowth. And so, yeah, to just try and open up some of these threads. Right. Um, I guess country music can be interpreted in so many different ways and it feels as if everyone kind of has their own interpretation or personal bond to it. But when we first started the project, we were initially planning on call it, calling it Dull City as a reference to the feeling one could have when growing up in a smaller town or even being in a city where it feels as if nothing's really happening or even the feeling that one would have when growing up and wanting to be part of something that you couldn't physically be part of, how we were kind of stuck in a small bubble um, and weren't really surrounded by any cultural input, basically that you were living in a dull city. Um, but we decided that having this name might have a bit too many negative connotations and it would also be quite misleading that the countryside isn't only dull and boring, it also holds a lot of potential, which we wanted to highlight and promote this, and also realizing that many of our friends, but also some of the most interesting artists and producers had connections to different rural areas, but had ended up living in larger cities. It kind of made, made sense to try to link all these stories together. And it also felt um, as if it would be a good way to connect similar stories from different parts around the world. So, <clears throat> but then when we uh, switch to the name um, country music, it actually has um, a direct link to American country music. I was working in a wood workshop at the time and I was listening to a lot of podcasts all day and then I listened to a podcast from the New York Times about alternative country music. And there was an artist called Margot Price. And the whole debate was like, is this country or is it not? Is it too alternative? And then on my way home from work, I put on one of her tracks called um, Hands of Time. And it was like late at night, it was raining and my bike was broken and I was miserable and then I was very moved like she was talking about like hardship and struggle and not having like make ends meet and I was just thinking about how much that is all of our situation like our friends and the producers and artists that we know but for some reason country music in the sort of like nostalgic American way has become um, the music for work or for hardship or sort of like ideas of the land and of geography. And this seems very sort of kind of um, unfortunate to give away like all these topics that, you know, all of us struggle with in capitalism and just living in this world. So we just thought to sort of like, you know, pose the question like what could an alternative country music be? And what could a music of the land be? And, and what's interesting is the country music um, it's um, is very sort of narrative and lyric focused and what we're interested in is sort of electronic music and more sort of without lyrics necessarily or sort of time and tempo but how do you sort of express ideas of maybe work and frustrations and anger not through um, lyrics but through other ways such as tempo and this is when we sort of um, 
decided to sort of like to always have these eight minutes so you can really focus on sort of like temporal shifts and other stuff um yeah i mean it's super interesting to think like i don't know it has a really nice quality like the name of your label because of the on one hand the stylistic contrast between what you would typically think of as country music or maybe even alternative country music and then obviously like like typically artists on your label country music will be kind of pulling from hardcore from gaba from, from like different kinds of club music but also like i don't know i was reading some other interviews that you guys had done previously and you made some references to kind of like prototypical forms of, of country music as you guys think of it for your labels so electronic music that doesn't necessarily come from like a city club context I wonder if, if you can maybe like speak to a few examples of this and like what is this like this country music this electronic music that um yeah is happening in these like regional regional settings like yeah yeah I think like one good example could be Lento via Lento which is like when translated into English, it becomes slow and violent. It's an Italian genre that is almost abandoned or an historical genre in some ways. Um, there are a few producers doing Lento Violento today, and it's, but it's coming out in kind of a new form if compared to the stuff that Gigi D'Agostino, who was mm. the inventor of it, was doing back in the early 2000s. Um, and so it's gaining kind of a new interest from a new totally separate crowd from what it was initially definitely uh, yeah so it's kind of obscure obscure and mainstream at the same time and also what's interesting is like how it's popping up in different parts of the world not necessarily um in italy even though there are some italian producers still doing it but so we have released for instance the Caesar, who is from prague swedish land factory from sweden um who else? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Nashi. Yeah. From Italy and um but also yeah, I think like Lento also kind of captures in many ways captures the idea that we have of playing with tempo and intensity as Anna was mentioning, that it's something quite frustrating about listening to a really hard club track at a really slow pace and how right. Frustration, frustration and tempo with <laughs> you. Um, yeah, that frustration and tempo might be keywords in what we're trying to release. Um, but other genres, like we were discussing this as well, like for Gabber, for instance, that it also historically is very focused in one. Sorry. Um. Did the slide just switch off? Okay. No. Still, okay. Uh, Sorry about that. Sorry to interrupt. Um, but yeah, you had mentioned some other, there are other genres. Definitely, I can think of a few um, that were like very formative for me, like Midwest hardcore, which is like basically like, I don't know. Yeah, it's like kind of like, it's hardcore, but all the parties were in bonds in the mid 90s. And in Australia, there's like a kind of like hardcore scene in the 90s in Newcastle, which is like a kind of industrial, post-industrial city. So mm -hmm. it's like interesting to see these, these resonances with like something about like very like hard music that's also like very out of the city somehow. And like, yeah, kind of speaks to like the different working conditions that are like in these regional areas. So yeah, exactly. I mean, we're gonna listen to some examples as well, like of tracks from, from your label. So hopefully this will make it a bit clearer, but yeah, super interesting. Yeah, um, right. completely. Um, but um, how how did your interest in uh, degrowth uh, emerge? And we were wondering if you could give a short overview of your current thinking and, and work in degrowth and climate research, and also <clears throat> speak about your geographical position uh, in Australia, where I think you grew up, and, and if that impacted you. Uh, at yeah, sure. Yeah, as I mentioned in my little intro of myself, I'm like have a, a research practice and like a, a music practice, I guess. Um, and so degrowth is basically just to like quickly define it, I guess degrowth is a movement, um, like a social uh, justice and ecological justice movement, but also is typically it's kind of like an academic field as well. 
And um, it's a basically a critique of the idea that economies should continue to grow. And um, it's a critique from lots of different angles. It challenges the idea that economic growth is good for people. It's definitely challenges the idea that you can have sustainable ecological economic growth. Um, it's actually very detrimental, or like I would argue. Um, and it also is like a kind of utopian vision at the same time. So it tries to imagine a society beyond capitalism, first of all, but also beyond productivism and growth. So not a kind of a communism where you would be producing uh, lots of uh, goods and consuming lots of goods, but um, a basically a lifestyle that's like um, that is just and also within ecological limits. Um, so there's a lot of like different kind of complexities tied up in this movement. Um, but I really enjoy working in it and I came to it because I was really frustrated with like my previous kind of focus. So I used to be really into literary studies and there's a field in literary studies called eco-criticism, which is basically concerned with questions about generally like how can all different types of media make you more ecological, environmental, like can music make you more connected with the environment? Can movies or like books make you more connected with um, ecology and climate change? And I kept finding that the answer was like, no. So this might come up later, but I have a very like conflicted relationship about whether you can make ecological or political art. Mm -hmm. um, so, but basically like in my, in my research work, I try and just like learn as much as possible about degrowth, not to kind of produce new insights, but to be able to pass those insights onto others. And my main kind of thing that I do is like basically give talks about degrowth to different audiences at the moment, a lot of like art school kind of settings. So to students, um, but I also like developed a lot of my work during a residency that I did at Trust, which is a kind of incubator space in Berlin. Um, and I kind of critiqued um, some different left visions for the future um, and also their aesthetics um, from a basically from a degrowth perspective. So that's kind of where I'm coming from, from, from like the, the research perspective. Um, geographically, I'm from Canberra in Australia, which is like a really weird, also small town where there's not that much going on. Um, and it's very strange as well because it's a planned city and it's a capital city and it's like, um, it's got a very weird vibe. So like, I, I don't know, like being in Australia did influence like my politics to some extent in terms of like um, a kind of social and ecological justice this movement that is also about giving land back to indigenous people um but it also like influenced me musically in terms of like developing my musical interests like mainly purely through the internet and like only having access to different different like musical scenes um in that way and that kind of stayed with me um so like I'm mainly like an online music person and I think we're going to talk about clubs and club settings a little bit more later but yeah basically I'm kind of like based all in the in the internet in terms of music. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, I don't know. I guess like the idea of country music definitely resonates with me uh, based on like uh, how I grew up. So, yeah. I think it really does for most of us. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. I mean, one of the, um, another kind of interesting concept that I have seen you guys discuss um, is this idea or a kind of theory that comes out about like, um, and it's interesting because there's similarities to kind of theories uh, that are used to degrowth, like world systems theory, but basically there's this idea um, like that you find in different disciplines, but also in how you guys talk about your label where there's like a core region and a periphery region. So the core is basically like, you know, a bustling city, it's the hot spot, And then the periphery is like the outside that is like, um, trying to kind of move in towards the core and the, the core also like relies on the outside to to survive. Um, so that's a kind of like, I don't know, maybe like a nice thing. I, I'll definitely use this language as we like continue through our discussion, core and periphery um, as a kind of placeholder for like city and country. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as you mentioned, there's like, you've worked with a lot of different artists and um, you mentioned that like a lot of your friends as well, people you are personally connected to um, are from like uh, smaller towns and they've had to move into the city. Um, and I think what I want to get at is maybe to talk about like, what is this relationship between urban and rural as you see it in the, the music scene? Is it like a kind of oppositional relationship or like, how do you see it? How, 
and like not to add another question on top of this but like has your concept of like how urban and rural relate to each other has that changed from you guys actually running this label and like have you changed your ideas about that i guess so i guess when we started we were kind of strict about this idea that most of the people that we would work with would have some connection to the countryside or the rural regions in some way but in the end it's I mean, now not all of the producers that we have invited are like explicitly connected to a periphery. I don't think it would have been possible to. No, the, yeah, at least the geographical yeah, yeah, periphery. Exactly. Because um, I think like for people growing up on a, uh, in rural areas, if you're interested in the same type of culture that we're all interested in or in contemporary dance music, contemporary art, you will most probably at some point in your life end up living in a larger city um that you're kind of forced to it if you're if you want to take part of a scene even though nowadays with internet and forums it's like everything has become of course more accessible um yeah and i think also we had to like check ourselves because even though we both grew up in small towns and our first ideas was you know especially like how do you keep active as a producer in a small town and i to say like maybe you produce hardcore for the car or your friends and stuff like that. And those were kind of the, the producers that we wanted to capture and, and highlight and, and showcase. But then we thought about us that we you know, moved to bigger places and, and we thought that was important. So of course, there's so many reasons that people, you know, want to leave the countryside and maybe return and maybe not, but it seemed like unfair, we would hold people to standards that we had sort of abandoned in a way. And maybe also we think it's interesting like now to can, especially in you know this pandemic times that we might come back to, like how do you exist in a core and a periphery at the same time? Like how do you move in and out of them and how how do they change as you say? And you know, with the internet so much of it is changing and um, there's so many ways of, you know, what a coordinate periphery relationship is and... Because um, I guess we've also been trying to use, or like play with the concept of the periphery in, the, in kind of a wide, wider sense that also the music that you're producing could also be interpreted as, as something made in the periphery, as in made in opposition to something mainstream into yeah. opposition to mainstream techno or even mainstream deconstructed club music if you can even call it that but i guess nowadays you can i think uh, so <laughs> yeah <laughs> so i guess to some extent like country music could manifest as a symbol of counterculture in that how the rural will always be measured in relation to the urban but quite rarely the other way around Definitely. Yeah, I think it's interesting to like, um, it's an interesting way to embed like this tension um, or like, yeah, to kind of have, I mean, would you describe it as a kind of anti-city music or I guess not? Because it's like there's, it's really hard to draw a line between these two environments because the people, people are always like, you know, trying to move from one place to another. There's obviously city people who will like escape if they're lucky enough to rural areas like many have done in the pandemic as well. Or maybe they're like, go to some hideaway so they can like produce their house music or something like that. I don't know, but like, I, you know, it's like, it's very fluid, right? No, exactly. Yeah, and, and also, so I think we were very focused on geography in the beginning because maybe that's what, what we were thinking of and what we were experienced, but then, yeah, just, you know, thinking of the periphery more conceptually, there's, you know, so many, um, you know, possible ways and, and so much of the original core and periphery theory are coming out of peace studies and even mathematics and it's such a sort of interesting concept that I think we um, are a bit right now also um, thinking of exactly where to take but then mm -hmm. I think with pandemic sort of geography is even coming yeah. back as something a lot of people are considering right now so yeah we're back at the full circle. Yeah. Definitely. Um, but um, so 
you have open now the slides of, um, of the first images from your EP on TT, um, mm. Fantasia from um, Fantasia's for Locking, and in the SoundCloud um, sort of text uh, for the EP, it says that you um, made it during a period of thinking of research into badly rendered eco-modernist futures and alternatives to these um, or and the alternatives that degrowth might provide. And unlike me and Daniel, who don't have a theoretical practice um, per se, um, you as a, a writer and researcher, um, how did music influence your writing and, and theory and vice versa? It <laughs> seems like you weren't convinced uh, if it can. But it must have yeah. something. It, it has, it's a really tough one. I think it's like, sometimes I'm like, oh man, such a hard question to answer, but I think it's good to talk about it and like to be uncertain about it because yeah, I feel like I have such difficulty when I see other music that's very conceptual and like there's a lot of kind of theory about like, can, does art have a political effect? And like, I mean, I'm not gonna get into all of this now, but there's very, very kind of compelling arguments that says like, it's too hard to say whether your art can really make like an actual political difference. So like, it really depends on the context and you really don't know what's going to happen. Um, and so like, typically when I'm the relationship that I see like between making music and my politics is that I'm like in my mind, they're like very separate, but I think they're also not because I'm doing them both at the same time. So I think like the key word in this little, the text that it was really hard to come up with for like when I did the release is like it's during like so at the same time that I'm doing research I'm also making music because it's like that's like how I relax or whatever um, and I think that they are related and they're seeping into each other but I'm not trying to figure out like how that's exactly happening and it's not a kind of conscious thing that I'm doing um, but like for example like usually when I research I'll take little screenshots of like short texts like or like little sentences that I think are really poetic and they will often end up as like song titles so like I'll use that little space where text is available and that's like I would just like bring in my research there um and yeah it's like it's it's definitely um it's difficult I think it's like also good to like be able to have this like hard kind of angsty music because like I do obviously feel very conflicted and like kind of confused when you do any sort of like things where it's like thinking about the future and could there be alternatives to capitalism typically like it's a very like roller coaster thing where you'll be really hopeful because like something's happening in the world and then you know it gets kind of taken over by capitalism and then you feel really depressed again and I think like definitely music is one of the only art forms that can capture and like relay to other people this emotional roller coaster like I just it's, I always think that music is like much more emotionally impactful than than other art forms or like that's how it is to me um, so yeah, it's like a bit of a conflicted relationship, but I think it's like, it's just mainly connected by like, I'm doing both at the same time and it's like how I'm feeling about it, but not really on a conceptual level. So yeah. And I think that's like a healthy, a healthy gap to like have between the two, the two things. And it's not necessary to have like really elaborate concepts for, for one's work all the time. Yeah. <clears throat> it's, it's interesting with, um, I guess the internet spaces that we move in as well, that they are somehow sort of like coexisting and there's so many overlaps with, you know, art and theory. And I don't know if, you know, in other times you would have more sort of separated practices, but now um, they sort of, you know, coexist in such a nice way, even though, you know, they might not be mirrors of each other. and that's um but we were going back to to your tt release and and i think we had sort of forgotten that it was called fantasious for lock-in so when we read it now we're like oh damn that's so interesting because you know with the um, lockdown or quarantine uh it seems very fitting um to have these sort of like shutting fantasies but so this was made before the pandemic uh we were wondering if this was something that you had in mind or could have imagined and if this changed at all um, to you um, at this time. Yeah, it's like a creepy coincidence, the kind of the similarity. And like, I also think the mood of the music is maybe like, I guess we'll maybe play some examples in a little bit. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, like the, when I titled the release, it was just meant to be like lock-in, which is a term that people use when talking about the failure of institutions or governments to kind of deal with, with ecological um, solutions and to kind of put them into action. So the idea is basically that because of the way things that things happen over time, it's kind of like you get stuck in a bad habit and then you can't get out of it. It's almost impossible, but basically like at the government level. So in systems theory and also just like in kind of political science, people will talk about lock-in or path dependency. Um, and it's kind of like, um, this, it's a very like nihilistic kind of way to title the album because it's like my concept was basically like oh we're like heading towards like climate doom and like these are like some like some like fantastical music that's like helping distract me which is like probably like more honest about like how I feel about the whole situation than I would ever be in my kind of researcher when I have my researcher hat on um but it was interesting definitely with the pandemic because it showed like so much about the kind of the failures of a growth-based economy and um, it's kind of like all the feelings that I've been having kind of building up to this moment. It was kind of like um, there was something weird about like living in a world where everything was really functional, but you know that it's actually collapsing and you just you're too you're too protected to be able to see it. And then with the pandemic, very protected, like kind of sheltered people like me and my environment, you're suddenly impacted by this like external event. Um, and like all the things that I knew were the case in theory started to like show up around the world uh, with like collapse of supply chains um, and things like this. So I think there, there is a kind of, yeah, a creepy link to it, even if I didn't like predict it or anything like that. Um, but yeah, so yeah, it's definitely interesting to like come back to it and think about it again in these times for sure. Yeah. Um... I'm wondering if we could play um, one of uh, the tracks. Yeah. Because uh, we, there's, seems to be an interesting sort of um, 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 a dissonance almost, I don't know if I want to use that word, between the sort of very airy and sentimental and beautiful melodies and then um, I've seen you reference gameplay and fantasies and mass market melodies and and there seems to be a nostalgia to these melodies, but then they they have sort of this hard uh, dissonant um, sort of baseline. So we were wondering if um, how references to um, Sanja and Utopia and 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 how they sort of like the balance between the two, um, the melodic and the sort of like the heaviness works in, in your music. But maybe we should listen. Yeah, to let's see if it should be working. <laughs> Yeah, so they have almost like a oh sorry, they have almost like a lullaby quality to them, and I guess we were wondering if you wanted to like, you know, have people soothe people and then upset people, and 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 if there's both nostalgia and utopia in 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 those decisions. 
Yeah, I think that's like a really nice way to put it in a way that I haven't thought to to describe. But I think that definitely makes sense, though. Like, I think there's always like, I mean, also when you think about art, where it's like, if it's purely dystopian, it's kind of corny. And if it's like purely utopian, it's also kind of corny. And I think it's like cool. I personally really like work where it's like you're finding a balance between the two and then it just becomes much more nuanced and like. I think that like I was I mean there's a lot of really good kind of internet music where it's like they use a lot of nostalgic melodies that are actually nostalgic like a tattoo song or like Britney Spears or whatever and then they will have like Gabber on it. I feel like that's a really common combination but one that I was like really obsessed with for a long time and um I was also really interested in like um within breakcore like this baroque core genre that is like kind of represented by artists like Igor or like Ruby My Dear where it's like there's a really like strong contrast um between like these kind of like Beethoven like uh melodies and then obviously just like breakcore percussion and like lots of weird sounds um but I think it's like you do see that like somehow they they match together and for me it's a really satisfying thing so just like on a musical level like also whenever I listen to like classical music pieces a lot of the time I'll be like I wish there was like some breaks on this and then like that's Mm -hmm. Basically, like, that's the main reason, like, why I have music that sounds like this, I suppose. Um, But, yeah, I think, like, it's really nice. I really respect when other people can, like, achieve that combination. That's definitely what I want to try and go towards as well, where it's, like, it's not one emotion outweighing the other. And also, like, you know, in terms of political projects where it's not purely trying to convince everyone that it's all about utopia or purely just kind of critique everything and being super pessimistic and only seeing a dystopia and like I guess in degrowth the idea is that you have to have both and so like maybe it's cool if this is like if you imagine this as a degrowth music to try and also like merge both together so yeah um I wonder like we're moving along pretty quickly through our time I wonder if we should now (laughs) play some country music songs as well and kind of talk about them what do you guys think sure yeah all right cool I will switch along hopefully yeah Cool. So um, here are two like tracks that I picked out um, that I thought were super interesting in terms of like representing the range um, of the music that you guys put out. Um, But yeah, and also kind of like coming back to this, like the some of the prototypical like country music, hard music genres that we discussed, like Lento Violento. and again, like, I guess maybe even in these artists' biographies, maybe you can speak a little bit about that, but maybe these, like, people embody this, you know, the fluidity of rural and urban because they have moved, like, between these different places. Um, and, like, yeah, I mean, maybe we will, like, listen to this and then kind of discuss some some possible questions, but I'm just going to play both of these. Is that cool? Mm-hmm. Sure. Sweet. Okay. So this one is by DJ Caesar called Base Planet. Let's hear it. Underprivileged people who will be most affected by this for our children's children and for those people out there whose voices have been drowned out by the politics of greed. I thank you all for this amazing award tonight. Let us not take this planet for granted. I do not take tonight for granted. Thank you so very much.
yeah. So um, two kind of different tracks, but I were they released actually around the same time? I guess the art is quite yeah. similar. It's yeah. Put out in 2018. Cool. Uh, a couple of months in between, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's a pretty interesting uh, choice that you choose uh, that you chose these two because I don't think we would have uh, chosen them necessarily as sort of like representative of the project. Uh, but I think it's it's nice because they're not you know, the most sort of from the countryside or the most different or sort of, um, you know, they're both two artists that are based in, in, in Europe and we have, you know, plenty of artists who aren't. But I think what's interesting is that they, they did come out just after each other and they have sort of like a couple of the format from, yeah, formats and, and informal decisions that we did, like to have, you know, all of them to be, you know, eight minutes and also to, to name a place. And and I think both of the artists chose to have put down the place that they live in now, but a lot of other artists chose, you know, like a place they once lived or, you know, remember or whatever, but we wanted to have those two formal qualities. So you could sort of get a lot of other variations and especially in sort of like tempo and intensity that that would sort of come across or have people, you know, to set the, the frame for, for greater focus on that. Um, so those were my yeah. uh, <laughs> just caveats. I also liked how you described or like use the term internet music, because I think like when speaking of genres, we're like trying to describe also the sound that we put out. It's like internet music for me is a very open and loose category somehow, and it isn't necessarily relating to a specific genre. And I think like from an outsider perspective, perhaps that the releases that we have put out over the years still have a kind of specific sound, but hard to pinpoint to a, a genre. And I think it's perhaps more connected to like context or um, I guess for us, at least like most of the people that we find, like the producers that we don't know personally, we find them on SoundCloud. And I guess like internet music in that sense is like, what brings them all together. Yeah, and, and did you see sir, for example, is someone that's very not in our networks uh, or that we personally know, he's a bit of a legend in the Lento Vio Lento circles. If there is a YouTube clip um, from a Czech big brother that exactly. he, was, he was in. And we actually didn't know until we had spoken with him that we didn't connect it until very late, uh, so. No, it was kind of a mind blowing experience, like because <laughs> <laughs> we had seen you know the clip and then. Yeah. But and I think, here maybe then the periphery is the working like DJ Cesar is so you know productive and has a very kind of active SoundCloud, but he doesn't. He's not on the sort of. He's not part of any scene really. It's like, if you talk about the bedroom producer, perhaps I guess he's like. A, a perfect yeah. example of, of that, like we're being really inspired by, from a scene that like in Prague, as far as I know, and also in speaking to other DJs that I know in Prague, it's like he's the only one basically. So yeah, no one's yeah. like, you don't know. And, and then Gil is different and he's, he's you know, active in, yeah. in I guess it's also like what we're what speaking we about seen, but... previously about being forced or not perhaps being forced, but that you choose to move to a bigger city because that's you want to be part or like that's where you have your main audience. And I think like that's also yeah. what's common for a lot of the people that we release who live in larger cities. That Definitely. Yeah. yeah, and most of them are quiet, sort of has a lot of emotionality to them but in yeah. very you know different ways and at the same time being quite hard um, yeah it was it's... a very <laughs> nice sorry go ahead it was happy that you decided to choose those two yeah, yeah. Um, i mean nice it's that. it's interesting because of like i don't know it's just it's interesting with like the way that your label or some of the formats that you used to have with this kind of eight minute thing and people can kind of fill the eight minutes however they want and also for me, like kind of picking the tracks, it's kind of like everyone 
is all on like this level playing field and it doesn't matter where they're from they're all part of country music and they're all in this new space like that you've created with your label and like the way like I highly encourage people to check out the website of country music country-music.co to like see it's like a whole universe basically and like I don't know the visual style really adds to this so it kind of brings it all into one place even though actually like people come from from very, very different environments so like in one way, the approach of the label seems to kind of achieve this thing that people always say about the internet, which is that it's like, it means that everything is accessible to everyone. Everyone has an equal chance, like this kind of like internet democracy kind of narrative where it's like bringing everything in the same place. But then I'm also curious, like whether you guys think like, also in your experience of like being artists or like um, kind of being active in scenes that take place both online and in real life, do you think that the internet has kind of like flattened out all the barriers between like, you know, hierarchy, different spaces, who has access to which scenes? Or do you think that there are still like a lot of barriers there that face artists, like even in spite of the internet and like maybe even exacerbated by some of the platforms that we rely on that like host internet music scenes? I really think like, <laughs> It's a, it's a difficult question, but I think that a lot of people, um, of course, internet has made it so much more accessible and easier for people who aren't part of a scene to become part of something. But I still think that having um, a physical presence and being part of a scene in person still, in terms of career or success or um, getting getting more attention i think it's still like i think it's been interesting now during the, these last few months when everything everyone trying to adapt to an online presence um like speaking of art institutions for instance this kind of um sad to see like how bad some people are at adapting <laughs> and i think like for the internet music scene at least like for for them it's always been or that for the last decades, at least, it's been so much of being able to present yourself online that people are so used to it. And yeah, and I think there's still a lot of issues around sort of money and and how you get <clears throat> paid for things. Even you know, Bandcamp is you know has gotten a lot of attention for their um, to what some of the decisions that they've done in the pandemic, but I don't know if, if that is enough. And I think a way that we have thought of it, um, we spoke before about, you know, we sort of sometimes frame it as an art project and sometimes as a text project, but most it's mostly a label. Like most of what we do is to release music, but that the music we release for free on SoundCloud and, and we don't even have a band camp. <clears throat> so there's, no revenue in the actual releases and then from the beginning we sort of thought it would be an interesting way to see to mix it up with art because there is more art funding and you can write a proposal you can get sort of traditional way of you know travel grants and exhibition money and sort of how to um make that into one big project but it also is i think we're starting to feel a bit more uneasy with that because it's you know, it's a way of existing, but it's not really a way of, you know, helping people like better uh, practices to exist. Um, so um, that is one, but then also in general, just to think about what a label is, you know, if, if you know, the internet is completely democratized and I don't know, you know, if you need a label and I don't, I don't know yeah. if you do, but then I think for us, the way we have been to like see our qualities and, you know, maybe incorporate design and some other curatorial things to sort of add a platform that then we can get, you know, we've done a couple of music festivals and, and then make sure that we bring in the artists that we worked with previously and make sure that they get paid, you know, through that and just figure out ways of, that we can, you know, help other people, but then also um, explore some ideas of our own and sort of exist in a sort of collaboration space but it's really hard to know who benefits from what and 
This is also something that we wanted to ask you if, if you have any thoughts of you know, sustainable platforms and also how you can incorporate some ideas from degrowth into a more sustainable sort of music um, practice. Yeah, I mean, it's a tough question. I've just noticed, I think the screen sharing has switched off. I had an issue with my internet just now, but we're really like coming up towards the end of the yeah. hour. Yeah. So maybe let's make this like our final kind of discussion question, um, which is also the hardest question that I think we came up with when we were preparing this. It's always really hard to think about like what could be an alternative and like whether you're an artist in the music scene, whether you are like a degrother trying to kind of figure out, to figure out different ways that you could run the economy there seems to always be this like this challenge of like I mean on the one hand it's kind of easy to think about like what would the features be of a good alternative so from a degrowth perspective that's like on two levels obviously it has to be ecological and there have been you know there's different things like streaming services that plant trees like for however many streams that you have there's different decisions that the artist can make like in terms of wanting to minimize like streaming does have an environmental impact because of like the um, energy use and so on. Or like maybe you don't want to like have vinyl because that also is maybe having an impact. So there's this kind of calculus that you have to do of like, okay, well, what is, you know, what what is the, like the minimum thing that I can do here? Um, but then like on the other hand, it's not enough to just like have an ecological service. It needs to also be like just and fair. So uh, you would need kind of like, something that is paying well, something that is sustainable financially for artists. Um, but I think also in terms of like, what is the power structure? Right now we have a lot of centralized platforms. A degrowth approach is typically like, it depends, but there is a strong push for decentralization, which goes for like your power supply, but also like maybe for a music platform. And the idea is that like the more decentralized something is, it really depends, but it can be then more democratic and more fair and people get to like have their own decisions about how things are run and um i mean i think there's like there's obviously this platform resonate which is kind of maybe trying to achieve uh this kind of approach it's a cooperative so like their business model is somehow like degrowthy or sustainable they um want it to be ethical um and i think there are like probably other examples or case studies of like different platforms maybe like you can think about more broadly the kind of patreon economy like whether that's kind of going in a more decentral direction or not, like maybe, I mean, I think it's like, it's hard because small communities are not necessarily always like super emancipatory. If it's like something like Patreon has control over your income. Mm -hmm. um, so there's like obviously a lot of questions. I think the one thing that I would want to wrap up my answer to this is like thinking about not just about like the qualities of the alternative platform, but how does it exist in relation to the thing that is like happening now so like there's a really cool part of like this text which is um called i think what is to be done by end notes and it's about communization um which is like a kind of somewhat far left theory but basically it's talking about like how should you think about alternatives to capitalism and basically the idea is that you shouldn't just have something exist side by side to capitalism you shouldn't try to escape capitalism like if you just have a farmer's market or whatever, it's just going to be like, then only rich people can go there. And it's not really a real alternative. So the idea is that you can't, it, you need to be constantly at war with the thing that you're trying to create an alternative to. So my kind of conclusion would be like, it's not just about creating an alternative to SoundCloud. It's about trying to create an alternative to SoundCloud and Spotify. That is like simultaneously trying to destroy SoundCloud and Spotify. And that's like, that would be my degrowth position for what the alternative should be. Um, yeah, I don't know, like, it's, it's a tough one, but yeah. Do you guys have any thoughts on that as well? Um, no, I don't know. I mean, I think that is something if, you know, I think we've, one question was also what we are going to do now in the future. And I think yeah. we're so, um, is it really tough, you know, time to be, cause <clears throat> as we spoke like, you know, putting everything online isn't the alternative if we don't have, you know, sustainable financial uh, systems. But at the same time, like thinking about like work and and other stuff, there's such high stakes, you know, at the moment with unemployment being so, and I don't know if it's, you know, the artist project is what role that has in all of this, you know, if it's, if it can sort of help with sort of emotional aspects or if it's just, you know, obfuscating the whole real stuff that needs to be done. So I think um, 
I think we've sort of taken um, a, a pause in what we had before, which was you know quite a lot of releases in a short time, and we haven't released something in in quite a bit. And yeah, I think we're definitely at a point of figuring out like how to move forward. How to move yeah. forward? Because yeah. uh, as you say, like we've had such a high pace over these last three yeah. years, and I think for me at least, like during the last few months, it's been really rewarding in a way that like having to be forced to slow down, like just having to think in longer longer terms or also realizing that things, I don't know, we've been planning on doing a book project now for, mm -hmm. for next year. And I think like that's also interesting, like how we can kind of choose which projects we want to, yeah. to involve in. Um, um, what, what, what about you? What's, um, are you, do you have, will you continue to make music um, or go back? Because you've, you been... you've been releasing quite a lot. <laughs> yeah, these, during during the... The yeah, but I have a really like post the draft mentality or whatever, like nothing is really finished. And like, I don't know, I feel like, yeah, I like post a lot of stuff on SoundCloud, but just because it's like, then I'm like, I'm not going to obsess over this track anymore. So I was thinking about like, yeah, obviously it's it's interesting. Like I want to keep making music and I want to make a lot of it and I want to get really good at it. And like, particularly on the melody side, I just really want to hone like this, this aspect of it because that's what really brings me joy about it. Mm. Um, but it's interesting to think about this as being like, well, is that kind of like a capitalistic thing if you're trying to be productive with your music and, and yeah. stuff like this. And I don't know, I was reading a really interesting paper which was about the experience of flow in capitalism and, and in alternatives to capitalism. So flow, the state of like challenging yourself, but like being really focused on something at the same time, which is like, I think a lot of people who produce music, it's all like DJ, you're like really in the zone. And like, basically the paper was saying that materialism prevents you from, from having these experiences. And typically we have very few of them under capitalism. So I feel like for me, it's like, it's interesting to think about making music and like putting out like a lot of music but not in a way where it's like, you know, something careerist, but just like needing to be in that state of flow and like having that as a release from like, just like working every day on stuff and like having that as a kind of my like mini utopia that I can do for a couple hours a day. And like, that makes me feel like I'm at least in that moment, I'm still free and like able to kind of to focus on what I want and like not be kind of distracted by false narratives and stuff like this. So that's kind of yeah the like low level kind of focus um i am like working on a project with a friend steph haltry she is a writer also at trust and um we she basically wrote these really amazing like utopian dystopian like four different science fiction worlds and um i've been then like scoring them and we will probably like release that uh, so like a kind of spoken word and then with like soundtracks on it as well because like yeah we were saying like soundtracks game soundtracks, movie soundtracks are an important reference for me. And like, now I'm actually gonna do one of like a, of a fictional world. So like, that's kind of, I'm really looking forward to doing that. Um, but yeah, I think like, it's like, whatever pace you have, it's all about like being able to choose it. And that's like a very, very lucky thing. And like also can be a radical thing as well. Like being like, um, I get to choose how fast or how slow I do my music stuff. Um, so yeah, that's basically what I would take from that. Cool. Um, so we've hit the hour mark. Yeah, it's so interesting that the uh, the sunset. I think both of our rooms were quite bright when yeah. it was, <laughs> was nice. <laughs> dark. We are in a real space. Right? Yeah. So um, yeah, time lapse on this one. Um, yeah, for sure. I think. Um, I mean, we only have one little. I think question, um, which is just about like. It just says, so experiences growing up in a planned city versus like rural informal areas. Um, I don't know, yeah, what were the, maybe let's just like have a kind of like couple minutes chat and we can see if any other questions come up, but like, what was it like for you guys growing up in your hometowns? Like what was the vibe and how did you get into like doing music and art in those environments, like your personal trajectory? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I guess like the two cities where we grew up were quite similar in the sense mm -hmm. that they were both like quite heavily depopulated and de-industrialized during our upbringing. 
Mm -hmm. um, so culture weren't really around at any time for me, at least. Like it mostly came through internet from through forums. And I was quite convinced at an early age that I would leave and move to a larger city. Um, yeah. Now I'm like more turning towards moving back at some point. Not to not to the city where I grew up, I think, but I'm I'm ready to try out the village life for yes. for a while. Yes. Yeah. And what about you, Anna? And we were saying earlier, thinking about sort of just material culture and stuff, because both of you know our towns used to be sort of big. You know, important to sort of Swedish history and economy and sort of production hubs and they were um, prospected to be a lot larger um, both of them so infrastructure and sort of the city planning is all made for this sort of you know the phase that never happened which was one of expansion so there's so much like old stuff and empty buildings and debris and just um, a lot of material surplus around that I think if it was in another place where sort of land was more uh, scarce, then it would have been, you know, rebuilt or taken care of, but now it's just there to exist. So I think that is you sort of live in many periods at once. You sort of, it's like, you know, a time of, that never came and it's a time of history and it's just, you know, so much space. And I think this is, I've been living back home for five months now, and I think it has manifested in a way that people hang on to sort of, um, you know, materialism, like dollar stores and all these people buy a lot. And I think it's because, you know, we have some sort of idea that we belong to sort of a, sort of a ghost of a production past. And then there's no other way of you know, figuring out what to do than if we can produce, then we can consume. And I think maybe this is, you know, turned me into sculpture, which turned me into um, all this other stuff. And at the end of it now, I'm, I'm in design. Um, but I definitely think just seeing a lot of stuff around um, is interesting. But then one thing I thought of now when I came to the city again is that it's so nice to be around sounds again and hear, you know, like, even if you're isolated at home, you hear sort of families and kids and um and this you don't really do in the countryside so i want to do some sort of sound design and you know just figure it go into sound therapy maybe i don't know just to sort of yeah. cool but yeah. what you need to live a good life if you can't have people yeah. but yeah what about you yeah i don't know it's interesting like the the idea of like something like happened in the in the lockdown where it's kind of like well it doesn't really matter if you live in Berlin because like you can't do the one thing that's important here which is go clubbing which is like <laughs> I, I was not really interested in that anyway or like I had a weird experience moving here where I just after six months moving here I just stopped going out altogether for several years um and then it was like yeah just like just like this funny thing of like living in a club city without like ever really wanting to be in that environment and with the lockdown, it's kind of even more because it's like, I don't, it's like interesting what you were saying about how your artistic space is kind of meshed together or like I do my research and my music from just this one device. And it's like, I could also be anywhere doing that. It could be like home with my family. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's like, it's a weird thing. Um, it makes me think about like, I had a lot of friends um, from Canberra who came here and like many, many Australians come to Berlin um and and try their luck and like many are here but you know I had like um one friend who in, in particular who was like a really really prolific musician and was really wanting to kind of make it in Berlin but then got super disillusioned and was like bullshit the music here <laughs> like and then it, like went back to our hometown and is like doing amazing projects and it's just like kind of like I can do that but I can do it at home and like does his own club nights and stuff in like the Polish like recreational club or whatever this Polish restaurant where they have like a kind of disco room as well and it's just like the best you know and it, it is really nice like what I really miss about like my hometown is that like when there was an event because it'd be like every three months and like you would have a lineup which is like all these different like types of bands because there's only like one show or whatever so it's just like completely different stuff all on the same bill and like everyone rocks up because it's like, oh, you have to go to this. Otherwise it's like not going to be anything else. 
So whereas like when you live in a big city, it's like you never go out because you're like, oh, there's like always something on. I'll just like go the next time, whatever. It doesn't matter. So like, I don't know. Yeah, it's like it's an interesting one. I think like there is a weird thing, though, about living in a city where it's like really planned and Canberra is also meant to be more populated and more kind of Mm -hmm. vibrant than it ended up being. And it's interesting that like like cities are so spontaneous and they're so lively without even really trying, without too much planning involved. It's very kind of chaotic. And then like when humans attempt to recreate that environment through a planned city, like there's many other examples of planned cities where they just totally like are dead or they're kind of really like haunted or even, you know, industrial towns that have been moved on from. It's like humans can't really recreate that somehow. I don't know. It's a strange thing. It's like where you can't, capture that environment exactly so yeah i don't know um yeah i wonder like what's happening now with this yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah uh, yeah I mean, I think that's that's basically it. Like, we had a lot of other things to talk about, but... I have to do um, round two at some point. I have to, yeah. yeah that would be good. Um, yeah. It's the, the text version. <laughs> yeah. Um, of this talk. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, But yeah, it's been, it's been really <laughs> nice. Um, <sighs> hey. <laughs> um, yeah, what are you guys doing after this? Uh, I think we're going to go and grab a beer and then that have good. Uh, pizza. Yeah. <laughs> yeah nice. What about you? Um, probably just, I just got back from visiting my grandparents, also in a small town in the north of Germany, which is very nice. Um, but I'm super tired, so I'm probably just like probably gonna go to sleep. I don't know. It's kind of early, but like, yeah, I'm really <laughs> tired. I'm trying to check the um uh, wonder if we can see. I'm just afraid to like hang up or something. But yeah. I wonder what happened. Yeah, because my connection dropped out for a little bit and then I don't know if something happens with that. Yeah. I mean, as if we totally <laughs> didn't speak of it. It's so funny because I did a word count and then I Googled like how many words you can speak or how much you can read in a minute. And it was like 250 words. And right. then I did it in mm-hmm. all the our text. I was like, okay, this is 14 minutes. And yeah. then I was like, <laughs> pick up some more, but then I think before we even got to the first question, it was like half an hour. I know, yeah, but it was so fun. Maybe we can like turn it into a text or something. Apparently, we're mm. we're cool to finish up now, which is good. Yeah, um, but well, yeah, I don't know. It was good. We should like let's do something with the material. Maybe we can. Yeah, yeah, totally. I want to hear. Um, yeah. But yeah, I guess if we're still like on live, I don't know. Thanks everybody who watched. <laughs> <laughs> it was really nice, and thank you guys, and thank you TT for putting this together. Um, and yeah, everyone tune in for the for the next one. I think there will be another stream soon. So yeah, sure. All right, bye. Bye. <laughs> bye.